Welcome everyone. I'm really glad you made it here with us. Um, I'm Chingyi Chen. I'm faculty in the Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington Bothell. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to this talk in conversation with Mark Nowak tonight um, as part of the University of Washington Bothell Labor Colloquium in conjunction with the Labor Stories During Pandemic Times class and the From the Convergent Zone reading series. So before we get started, I'm gonna um, briefly mention some logistics for our talk and conversation tonight. I'm going to ask everyone to please mute during the talk. Um, and if you forget to mute and have a lot of background noise, we may mute you directly. Um, if you have any tech or access needs, um, please feel free to message Simon Wolf. Um, and I think, I think uh, it also says tech support and questions, um, and Simon can help you um, in the chat. Um, please don't message our guest speaker. Um, and if uh, Simon is tied up or busy, you can always also message me. Um, if you need um, captions, um, you can look at the bottom of your screen and click on the CC live transcript. Um, and you should be able to get either the full transcript or also um, the, the sh scrolling version of them. Uh, this talk will be recorded and may be available at a later date in the UW Bothell Labor Colloquium in our MFA archives. Um, and then after the talk, we are going to open up for a bit of conversation with the audience, um, which I'm going to moderate. And in order to ensure that we have multiple and diverse voices um, and to streamline questions, um, we're gonna ask you to please send your questions in a direct chat to Simon Wolf. Um, and um, I will curate the questions to pose for our speaker. Um, and um, I may ask you if you want, in that moment, if you want to ask the question directly to the speaker or not. Um, and if you have respectful comments or conversation, please also feel free to use the chat, it's open. Um, and because of time constraints, we may not get to pose all the questions to our guests this evening, but our aim is to have a, a lively conversation, an interesting conversation. Um, we are Zooming from, I'm guessing, many different places and feel free to put where you're Zooming from in the chat so we can get a sense of where you're coming from, um, including the you know indigenous, um, peoples of, of the lands that you're on. Um, this event is hosted by Utah Bothell, which was built upon the unceded homeland of the Willow Sammamish people. Our campus also touches on the shared waters of tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And what this means um, for me as an educator and writer living in the region is to commit to learning about the history and culture of these communities, to show solidarity for the continued fight for indigenous sovereignty, and to work on decolonizing our educational practices, including whose histories, stories, and lineages we center in our writing practices and education. And I would like to invite you all to um, do that alongside with me. Um, so many of the writers, artists, and thinkers who are sharing work with us in the series were invited with this question in mind. Whose voices do we not hear enough from and whose voices are not lifted up enough in our mainstream culture and society? And how can we collaborate to make more space to center these voices here as a community? Um, when I think about writers connected to this kind of work, um, our guest speaker tonight, Mark Nowak, is one of the voices which comes to mind, especially in support of working with writers who are also low-wage workers. Um, as the founding director of the Workers Writers School, which is founded at a Ford factory in 2011, um, Worker Writers organizes and facilitates poetry workshops with global trade unions, worker centers, um, and other progressive labor organizations such as the Domestic Workers, United, Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees, the Taxi Workers Alliance, Worker Justice Center, um, and a whole host of other organizations, which I'm excited to hear more about tonight. Um, and these workshops create a space for participants to reimagine their working lives and produce new tactics and imagine new futures for working class social change. Um, so Mark Nowak, uh, who is the founding director of, um, of the Worker Writer School, is also the author of books, uh, Shut Up, Shut Down, Coal Mountain Elementary, um, and Social Poetics, uh, all from Coffeehouse Press. 
Um, he is currently editing a revised and expanded edition of writings from the Attica Poetry Workshops um, of Celis Tisdale and a native of Buffalo. Um, Mark Nowak is also a former trade unionist and a professor of English at Manhattanville College. Uh, without further ado, I would like to pass the mic to our guest speaker tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to you, uh, to UW Bothell, uh, and it's great to be with you today. Uh, you know, as a teacher who's been teaching on Zoom for, what has it been, 14 months now, uh, I don't know you. Uh, I would love to see you. If for some reason you can't have your screen on, that's totally fine. Uh, but, you know, we've been social distancing for an incredibly long time. And so if I can see you, uh, I would love that. But again, I understand if there are circumstances uh, for which you can't do that. Um, I wanted today, to, um, you know, to be a little bit kind of informal talk, a little bit show and tell. Uh, maybe a tiny bit of writing uh, and a lot of question and conversation. Uh, so that's what I'm kind of shooting for today. Um, I wanted to start out with um, kind of three quotes to ground us uh, and to think about. And the first one uh, is I use as an epigraph uh, in social poetics for the chapter for which uh, today's conversation gets its title, A People's History of the Poetry Workshop. Uh, and the epigraph for that chapter uh, is from a, a, I don't even want to say a writer I admire, a person I admire very much, Muriel Rukeyser, uh, is known as a, as a poet, kind of the creator of documentary poetry for a poem she did um, uh, called US One about a mining disaster. But she was a uh, journalist. She covered the uh, Stockboro Boys case. She was uh, an organizer, like beyond an activist. Uh, if you type her name into Google with the letters FBI after it, you can download her entire FBI file. Uh, and so the quote in which I open uh, the chapter of People's History of the Poetry Workshop, and the first one I want us, I'm gonna kind of keep these three quotes hanging in the air, is if we are free, we are free to choose a tradition, right? Again, if we are free, we are free to choose a tradition, right? And what I want you to think about for just a second is that quote, right? And like, if we are free, well, I mean, a huge question right there, right? We could spend two hours talking, about, we could spend two weeks talking about that question alone, right? The first half of that sentence. But we are free to choose a tradition. And when you think about the traditions in which you belong to, are part of, were raised in, were forced into, right? And where you have been free and where you have not been free to choose what you wanted to do, right? And that can come from all kinds of outside sources, right? Or internal things as well, right? And again, if we are free, we are free to choose a tradition very important epigraph uh, that I open, really kind of open the book with. The second one is from uh, the Brazilian educator, Marxist, who's forced out of Brazil by the government for many years, Paulo Freire. Uh, and it's a quote from his about kind of where we are right now in the classroom, right? In school and in the classroom, in the university and in class. And that quote is, why not put into practice right in the classroom the school you dream about, right? Why not put into practice right in the classroom the school you dream about? And I talk to my own students about this a lot, right? And I always say, you know, if you ask people when they're in school what they hate most, they'll say most likely, or I would at least, like pop quizzes, right? final cumulative exams, these sorts of things. And then people go to school for many, many years, you know, they get their masters, they get their PhD, and they become teachers, and they suddenly start giving out pop quizzes and cumulative final exams. And there's a circle that repeats itself over and over and over as a way of punishment as learning, right? And so that Freire quote, again, why not put into practice right in the classroom the school you dream about? I think, to me, a, a super important quote. And then finally, putting these two together, right? 
If we are free, we are free to choose a tradition. And why not put into practice right in the classroom the school you dream about? The third quote is on this relation between theory and practice, right? Between ideas and action. And it's a very famous quote. I read it when I was an undergrad taking a philosophy class, reading Karl Marx, right? And that quote is from a piece of his called Thesis on Feuerbach. Uh, and I see Karl Marx on my screen as someone's backdrop. Perfect. I couldn't have paid for a better backdrop. Thank you very much. And that is Marx's quote from the Thesis on Feuerbach, 11th thesis, uh, final one. The, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Right? The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, semicolon, not two sentences, the point is to change it. So we've got this tradition and freedom question. We've got schools we dream about, and we've got this relationship between thinking and doing, right? Interpretation and change and action, right? All of these kind of swirling around. So it is out of this uh, that a lot of the work that I do comes from. And so the book Social Poetics is really divided into two separate parts. The first is very much like a, a research historical part, right? It is my interpretation, if you will. And the second half of the book is in many ways an interpretation and action, right? And they kind of move back and forth around each other. And so I take this idea of a people's history of the poetry workshop, of course, from Howard Zinn and his book, A People's History of the United States, and from E.P. Thompson and his ideas of uh, the making of the English working class. But what I apply it to is something that really it hasn't largely been applied to before, the poetry workshop, right? And so the idea for this sprung out actually out of action, right? When I was a grad student uh, in my MFA program many, many years ago now, right? Uh, in the late 80s, 1990, to date myself very badly. Uh, and one of the classes we could take uh, as a grad student was you were given a school class, like a middle school class in the local public school, and you became poet in residence for a semester at that class. So I got a fifth grade classroom in Bowling Green, Ohio, at Bowling Green Middle School, and I'd walk there every, like, I don't remember, Tuesday or Thursday morning, and I'd spend an hour with fifth graders doing poetry, right? We'd, we'd play, like, games to chance generate poems. We'd look at poems that, you know, I knew and was reading and learning as a grad student and use those as models to write. And so when I got out of grad school, in addition to doing my own poetry, one of the things I did was to continue teaching. And I moved to first Rochester, New York, and then to Minnesota. And I was always involved in poetry in the schools program. Uh, I got involved in poetry in the prisons programs. And so I started collecting books and anthologies. And it was only many, many years later that I, that I started to write and think about them, right? Because it's that quote, if we are free to choose, we are free to choose a tradition. I was placed in a tradition in creative writing, right? These were the canonized poets. These were the people you had to study people you had to know if you were going to be part of this hashtag poetry community as it is now on Twitter, right? You had to know these things. And so I just kept stockpiling all these little books. And eventually, um, about 10, well now 11 years ago, there's always this, you know, I don't know if you, if you all know this, right? Is that there's this like COVID, or if you have this, this like COVID delay Right? You can't, it's hard to count this past year. So you're always like, well, last year. And then you're like, oh no, that was two years ago. There's the social distancing year and then the year before that. But anyway, I've been, started writing this book and thinking about this book and bringing this in concept of a people's history of the poetry workshop together with these books I have been collecting and doing what we do in the university, what we do in the classroom, this practice called close reading of a poem. And I said, well, what if instead of applying that to the popular poets today or the modernist poets or the beat poets or whoever, I applied it to all of these books and anthologies I had been collecting that had been written by middle school kids, that had been written by prisoners, 
that had been, been written in South Africa by anti-apartheid trade unionists who got together and did this thing called a poetry workshop. It was through that that I could develop this idea like Zinn of not a top-down canonized poetry, but a people's poetry from the bottom up, right? It's also called in, in E.B. Thompson, writing from below, right? Not writing the story, the history of the kings and the rulers and the presidents, but writing the story of, of, of the people. So one of the first books I started to write and think about was this book by June Jordan uh, called The Voice of the Children. And these were from uh, poetry workshops that June Jordan and Terry Bush conducted in Brooklyn, New York, right during the time of the New York City teacher strike. And I'm not gonna say too much about that teacher strike, but if you wanna read about it, the, the, my book, Social Poetics, I contextualize it there. But I just wanted to read one poem, right, to give you a sense. And so this is a poem called Wonderful New York by someone named Christopher Meyer, who is 10 years old. Right? So this is a 10 year old. So he might have been uh, in one of my, my classrooms, right? If I had been doing, if he had been in Bowling Green in 1989 or 1990. So wonderful New York, right? And you sort of think about like, what would a, what would he be that fourth grader maybe? What would a fourth grader write about in a poetry class in the picture of New York? This is again, Christopher Meyer, age 10. The hypnotizing neon light the street banks like garbage dumps and the drunk vacuum cleaner who suck up whiskey like air converts my mind into a cemetery of the noisy. As New York provides a building for the UN, so shall it provide a cemetery. Invisible dangers are always around the corner as hell is around the corner for me. Right? Christopher Meyer age 10. And so what would, like, doing this practice of a close reading of that poem, like, how would we dive into it? How would we read those lines? Why the cemetery and the relationship to the United Nations building, right? Why all of this in, in a 10-year-old writing a poem in school? And so we could say, well, oh, that was like one poem. But what I started to discover as I kept reading these books I have been collecting, here's another one, which is a great one. It's called Stuff, a collected collection of poems, visions, and imaginative happenings from young writers in schools open and closed, right? And so even in the title, we're like, oh, schools were closing? Like these were events were happening in New York City at this point. And it's a book that was edited by Herbert Cole, who is, if you go on to study education and get a master's in teaching, someone whose books you will certainly read, really important educator and thinker about schools. And someone who at this point of this book is maybe, I don't know, 18 years old and goes on to become himself an incredibly famous poet named Victor Hernandez Cruz, right? And so this young poet and school educator edit this book together. And I just wanted to read, you know, I was looking through this and as you can see, I've got like post-it notes everywhere in this book, right? It's just like, I got notes everywhere because A, they're also hard to find, so I don't wanna write in them, but, uh, I want to keep track of all of these things that I've been reading. And so this is just a poem, like I was going through it today and saying, like, let me just see, maybe I'll read one from, from this book as well. And I came across this one by Wayne Moreland. And, you know, I, we've been following the news out of Minnesota, right? And following the news out of Chicago. And maybe you've been watching some of the trial, the George Floyd trial. And you saw what happened a couple of days ago. I lived in Minneapolis for 15 years. A lot of what I was talking about being a poet in school and a poet in the prisons, it was in Minnesota, in St. Paul and Minneapolis. Uh, so that I was reading through and that just weighing so much on me what's happening. And I came across this poem called Politics by Wayne Moreland in this book from, what is it, 1968 maybe, 1969, 1970, it was published. And it's, it's a long poem, it's like, two and a half pages, single space. But I'm just gonna read the first two stanzas because it, again, it just spoke so much to me about what we've been watching on TV and reading in the news the last few days and the last year and unfortunately the last forever, right? 
like since 1492, we've basically been reading this story. So these are just the first two stanzas of Wayne Moreland's poem from this book of happenings and from 1970 called Politics for JB Who Knows. A cop stepped on my face and I screamed out into the cold night for the help of my brothers. I screamed for some flesh to come and help my body to stop it from falling into the hands of little blue men. The metal night breathed into my ears as they beat me with sticks. And I did not understand even then that my life was not as slow as the weather. I did not understand why my body was being dragged through the streets of the Bronx. I did not see the moon watching under her nightgown and her coats, right? That poem just spoke so much to me about where we are April 15th, 2021 from this book by young writers in 1970, right? So it's written in 69, 68 probably, right? That's 50 years ago this poem so resonant for today, right? And again, we could do a close reading of this poem. We could look at the history of when it was written and the history of today and talk about, you know, police violence, defunding the police, prison abolition. You should make a great paper out of this two stanzas of this poem. And so again, I got, you know, poems from prisons. This one's called The Last Stop. Poems from Comstock, again, around 1970. Who Took the Weight? Black Voices from Norfolk Prison in Massachusetts by Elma Lewis, one of the first two Black Arts Movement inspired poetry workshops. The first of which was this one. Betcha Ain't by Celeste Tisdale, Poems from Attica. And this is the one that I'm helping Celeste to edit and writing an introduction for. It's been out of print for 45 years, uh, something like that. And so after the Attica prison revolution, uh, which I don't know how much people know about, uh, there's a great book that came out, won the Pulitzer Prize actually two years ago called Blood in the Water. But in September of 1971, there was a huge uprising in Attica, prison and to make a long story short, the New York governor, Governor Rockefeller, sent in the National Guard military troops to quell it and a large number of both prisoners and the guards who were hostages were killed in the uprising. Uh, there's an incredible documentary film uh, out about it too, which I really encourage people to look at. But this guy, Celeste Tisdale, uh, he went into prison every Wednesday and taught a poetry workshop. And I kept asking, why is there this relationship always between the Watts Rebellion and we have a poetry workshop? The New York City teacher strike, June Jordan does her poetry workshop. The Attica prison revolution, someone goes and does a poetry workshop. The Sandinistas, right, victory, Ernesto Cardinal institutes poetry workshops across the country. South Africa, anti-apartheid struggles. The main trade union organizes workers together like this guy, Alfred Temba Kabula, and they do poetry workshops at the trade union halls. Like it just kept happening over and over again. So again, I started with that quote from June Jordan. If we are free, we are free to choose a tradition. Uh, sorry, by Muriel Rukeyser. And then that notion of frary, why not put into practice right in the classroom, the school you dream about? So the school I dreamt about was because I came from a trade union family, right? Everyone in my family worked in factories in Buffalo, New York. My father was vice president of his union at the Westinghouse factory in Buffalo. I thought I'm teaching poetry in the schools I'm teaching poetry in the prisons. Why am I not teaching poetry in the factories, in the workplaces, right? In the union halls, in the trade union halls. So about 15 years ago, that's what I started doing. I taught a poetry workshop at a Ford factory that was scheduled to close in St. Paul, Minnesota, and then went to South Africa and worked with Ford workers at plants in Pretoria in South Africa. And this is the second part of this story that I tell in Social Poetics about how we could start 
you know, the prairie, the school you dream about, start it now. My dream was to do this. And I said, well, I'm just going to start contacting trade unions. I'm going to contact worker centers. I'm going to contact factories. And so again, I tell most of that story in this book, Social Poetics, but I want to turn this to conversation very soon. So I'm going to end with this one thing that 10 years ago, uh, PEN America, uh, organization for writers and human rights in New York City that Muriel Rukeyser herself was president of, uh, I think it was from maybe 75 to like in the late 1970s. Uh, they had found out about these worker work writing workshops I was doing, and they said, did you want to do one with us? Uh, and I said, sure, I'd love to work with a group called Domestic Workers United, who at that time in New York City, uh, was a group of nannies, uh, elder care workers, home health aides, uh, mostly from Central America, the Caribbean, Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, they had just won a workplace bill of rights. They had struggled and fought because uh, the US government, when it passed all its early labor laws in the 1930s and 1940s, left out domestic workers and farm workers. And you can view picture of that workforce, you can easily understand why the white politicians chose to do that, right? And so Domestic Workers United struggled for years and eventually got passed by New York's former governor, Patterson, the first domestic worker bill of rights in the country that gave some workplace protection to women, mostly 99% women, who went to work in other people's homes, right? If you worked 16 hours a day and you got paid for eight, you had no protection under US labor law until this bill was signed, right? If you were being abused in your workplace, you had very little recourse because of course you're an isolated individual in someone else's home. Very hard to prove those cases, right? So they asked and we did a series of workshops and then we did a reading at the Penn World Voices Festival where everybody read their work. Uh, the next year, we did it with the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, the yellow cab drivers in New York City. The next year, I moved here, upstate New York, where I am now. Uh, we did it with a group uh, called the Worker Justice Center that organizes migrant farm workers. And we did what June Jordan and all these other uh, workshops did. We workshop poems. We talked about poetry. We wrote poetry. And uh, we did events and readings. We did that for a couple of years until we decided to bring all the groups together. And so to start the Worker Writers School, we had members from the Taxi Workers Alliance, Domestic Workers United, the Street Vendor Project in New York City, which organizes people who sell food and articles of clothing and other things on the streets. Uh, we had people from Picture the Homeless, uh, the Damian Migrant Workers Association, Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees, a number of people would circle through the group and some stayed a very long time. We have a couple of members of Domestic Workers United who have been with us for 10 years now, coming to workshops what first Saturday of every month and writing poems, 10 years. I mean, I feel like I should give them a Master of Fine Arts degree in creative writing at this point in time for how much they've written. So we were working in, the winter, you know, February, March of uh, 2020, we had been looking at and studying uh, the poetic form called the haiku. Uh, Japanese poetic form, probably people have written one somewhere along the line, right? Three lines, syllable count, five syllables in the first line, seven in the second line, five in the third line. And we had had a, uh, uh, an event at a great space in New York City, if we're ever out and you visit, called the People's Forum. Uh, it's a really radical um, social movement incubator in the Garment District in New York. Do look up their website, uh, a fabulous organization. I'm actually teaching another workshop for them uh, on Saturday, a writing workshop uh, with a group, uh, a number of different groups. But we had an event there where we had uh, a really well-known probably the most well-known translator of Japanese literature, uh, Hiroaki Sato, came and did a workshop with our group. He had a new book that had just come out on a press called New Directions called An Haiku. It was a really uh, important book. And he came, talked to us and worked with us. And we kept coming back to this form of the haiku, right? Every other workshop, we kind of like would use it as an opening exercise. We write on it. And then on March, I believe it was 7th of 2000, 
the first Saturday, we always meet the first Saturday of the month. Uh, the news of the pandemic of this word coronavirus was just starting to be in the news in March of then. Uh, we knew nothing about masking at that point in time, right? It was about washing your hands. Remember, furiously, all of us washing our hands. And so we met on that Saturday for our workshop. Uh, we didn't hug each other when we came in the room, uh, thankfully. Uh, I had a huge bottle of hand sanitizer at the door at Pan America, and I would give everyone a couple pumps of hand sanitizer. But as I was walking to the workshop that day, I had this new word kind of spinning around in my head, right? Coronavirus, coronavirus. Like it was new, right? We had just heard about it for a couple of weeks at that point in time. And I realized that coronavirus, coronavirus had five syllables right? It could function as the entire line of a haiku. So when we sat around the table and started to write, I told everybody I thought of this and I said, well, we're all here workers, right? What today we would call essential workers or frontline workers, right? Anyone who's been part of the movement knows that these workers have been essential forever, right? But now they're being honored before a sports game or whatever, right? Essential workers. Uh, so I said, just write about your lives during these first days of like, what's it like to be a taxi driver? Like, how are you feeling? Write a haiku, use the word coronavirus, and you still got 12 more syllables to say it. So we worked that day on some coronavirus haiku. We all said our goodbyes. We did elbow bumps, right? Uh, and then everybody, all of us around the country, right? Went into our homes, started social distancing. Those who could stay home from work did. Those who couldn't, kept working like our members at the Worker Writers School. So as it was getting near the first Saturday in January, I said to, I'm sorry, in April, I said to everyone uh, in an email, well, we can't meet together, but there's this thing called Zoom, right? Which was new to us then too. And I said, let's just try to meet this way. And so I sent out the email. Uh, I didn't know who would show up, right? We usually have about 15 people, maybe 20 people at a workshop. So I sent them email uh, that Saturday, first Saturday in April rolled around. I turned on the Zoom and there came in two people and there came in three more people and then came in another person. And then there came in one person who had left home in December to take care of her mother in Trinidad. And she came on, right? Cause she was able to join us now because of this technology. And then a couple more people joined and we had, I think 12, 14 people in our workshop. And we wrote these haiku and we kept writing them and people were so thankful to be together like somewhat normal in our writing group, right? That they said, well, can we start meeting twice a month? So we started looking at all kinds of haiku, right? From modernist Japanese haiku to the haiku from this Attica book, right? Uh, there's a great haiku by a poet named Robert Packwood in that book. So we looked at the Attica haiku, haiku from the black arts movement, Sonia Sanchez, uh, Etheridge Knight, we look, Amiri Baraka has this form called the low ku, right? C-O-U-P. Uh, and it's kind of the, the people's revolution, right? The low coup. We looked at Japanese American internment camp haiku. We looked at, we had kind of tried to look at an entire radical tradition of haiku writing. And we looked at the masters. We looked at Basho and Isa, but we looked at Diane de Prima's haiku too. Uh, we had the poet Evie Shockley wrote a poem called Statistical Haiku. And she came and talked to us about it uh, and read her work and met with us. And so we kept writing all through our lockdown, all through our time uh, when people were forced to go still to work, right? Elder care workers, nannies. Uh, we have a member who is a uh, works behind the glass underground in the New York City subway in the booths. She kept going to work, the taxi drivers. And so we just kept writing and writing and writing haiku through the pandemic. And we have this book coming out called Coronavirus Haiku from the Worker Writers School. We have 13 members who were really came pretty regularly. It's not even out yet. The box of them just arrived at my house on Monday. Uh, so you're getting one of the sneak previews. But I'm just going to read one haiku from the book. No, I'm going to read these three. 
Uh, and this is by Davidson Garrett. Uh, he's a New York taxi driver, member of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. He's been driving a yellow cab uh, for about 40 years in New York City. Uh, and these are three of his haiku. And I'm gonna end on these and then we can open up for questions, conversation, uh, et cetera. And uh, thanks for putting the link uh, into the links for it into the, the chat. So these are by Davidson Garrett, three haiku, uh, New York City taxi driver for uh, 40 years. I'm gonna read five, they're short. Day driver starts shift. Chicken bones left on cab's seat by night driver slob. Second one, they're all not pretty by the way, no, I should have warned you. Starving cab driver gobbles provolone cheese. Taxi smells like feet. Well, I always talk about getting the, like how important it is, the haiku, not just the visual, right? But taste, smell, texture into it, right? I mean, that provolone cheese goes both ways in that haiku. It's like, it seems okay, and then it's downhill. Next one, time for coffee break. Cabby double parks by store. A cop tickets him. The cops turn up a lot in here. An old cab driver pees beside his parked car. Gold showers bathe curb. And finally, uh, a one here, it's really dark, right? It's almost 10 o'clock at night here in the East Coast. So this one seems a fitting way to end. So skyscrapers asleep, Manhattan, midnight, eerie, the moon keeps safe watch. Again, those are from Davidson Garrett from the not yet officially released coronavirus haiku book. So uh, I talked a few minutes more than I wanted to, but let's have a conversation. I wanna hear you. Uh, if you send in the question, that's super great. I think it's okay if people just ask a question too at some point here, right? Uh, or if you want to read your question out loud, that would be super too. Either way, I'm happy. Thank you so much um, for tracing such a rich lineage um, of writers and kind of calling them into the room. Um, both, I think, writers that some of us may know, but a lot of writers we, we may not be familiar with. Um, and um, one thing that, uh, one, um, I think, starting point I would like to ask you, uh, so we have a lot of writers in the room um, who are um, going to be working um, with community partners. Um, and I think some, some have a background in this and some do, do not. So I'm wondering if you have any um, tips or suggestions for folks who maybe are new to, new to this kind of work. Um, what would you say um, in terms of things to um, keep in mind or, or any suggestions? Yeah, I, um, I think there's a bunch of things, right? I think one is uh, a, a very hard one to do, but don't be nervous, right? Like you are leading the workshop, right? And so it, it's great to try to create as mo like an informal environment as you can. You know, I often run into this with, uh, you know, student teachers prepping to go out to do things and in, in my own classes and, you know, they love their PowerPoints. Uh, they're really good at them. Uh, they put me to sleep, right? So like a kind of an, uh, an inf creating an informal space, like a, a, a space where it feels safe to share, I think is really important. I mean, certainly check your ego at the door uh, is an important one. I, I, people in the Worker Writer School, I remember it was about the, the, the pen group. It was maybe like the fifth or sixth year into it where someone said, Mark, I saw you have a book out, right? And they were like, you have a book? You 
And, you know, I mean, I had like five books out maybe by that point in time, but nobody knew it because I was there to, to kind of facilitate the workshop. An important one that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and it doesn't work well, unfortunately, in your model, but I, but I put it out there as something to keep in mind, is I've think, been thinking a lot about the concept of duration lately and the relationship of arts programs to a short duration. Like we do something one time and then it ends. And then what happens to the people who were really interested in it? You could take this idea of like, oh, we've planted a seed or something like that, right? And yeah, I, that's an okay argument, but, but I sometimes worry about that, right? And I, I was thinking a lot, I've told the story a, some, a couple of times on Zoom already, but in different, in different forums, but you know, where I live, I, I, like I, when I go to the grocery store, right? I imagine like for me, it's usually, you know, here in rural New York, like at the big grocery store, a, an elderly woman who's the cashier, right? Someone maybe between 40 and 60 or more years of age, working not for a living wage, right? Being forced to stand, usually her entire shift, right? Like why cashiers can't get a, I'm not going to swear, but there's a word there, stool, right, is beyond me. Right. And if you've ever worked those jobs, I worked in a Wendy's for eight years. You never get a stool. You never get to lean. Right. And so if I think about her. Right. And she's there in the pandemic behind the shield. Right. Scanning everybody's stuff. Right. And certainly having an intellectual life while that's happening. Right. Like, why is this person buying three large bags of cool ranch Doritos? Right. And then maybe texting her partner, her friend during break, like, you won't believe what I saw today. This guy came through and bought three massive bags of Cool Ranch Doritos and a bunch of Mountain Dew, right? Like six cases of Mountain Dew. Like, so telling a story, right? Sharing it with others, right? Workers do this all the time. Workers, literature, storytelling is happening 24 seven, right? Through text messages, through Facebook, Instagram messaging, through Snapchat, through oral storytelling when they get home from work. The problem is we have not created community institutions for that to become something like what we're talking about here. That's the, one of the huge motivations behind, behind the Worker Writers School. How do we create an institution for someone like that cashier or the taxi driver or the Ford worker who wants to write poetry. So going back to my cashier story too, and this question of duration, right? I think about like, let's pretend she thinks, oh, I wish I could write this up. Like, I wish I could tell, write this as a story. First of all, she has nowhere to go in her community, most likely to be able to do that. And even if you started a workshop, say you started a writing workshop at the local library that met for six weeks, right? Those might be nights on which she got scheduled in for a shift. She might not have built up the courage to do it yet, right? It's a courageous step to go from scanning those Dorito bags to saying, I want to write this story. Right, that might not happen in six weeks of your workshop time. It might happen six months later, six years later, right? And so that's why for me, this question of duration of the worker writer school is so important. We are now celebrating the end of our 10th year of doing this, right? So you could have taken nine years to build up the courage and we are still here to do it, right? So what you're gonna be doing is a kind of a compact model of something in which you wanna be informal, right? Make this thing a great experience for people, but keep in the back of your mind that it's going to evaporate, right? And what is going to happen next? And I think this is a huge question really for, for the entire, not only the writing world, but the arts world in general. There's tons like really well-known artists. There was a, a thing that happened in the Bronx a few years ago called the Gramsci Monument, where they built this 
plywood almost city within the social housing in the Bronx and they had a radio station and an archive and you know you could do, hear lectures by you know David Harvey and Gayatri Spivak really famous theorists from from the CUNY Grad Center in Columbia talk about Gramsci they had like films all kinds of people's lending library and it was there for a whole summer and then they tore it down they packed it up it disappeared and the artist probably got a huge commission and I have the huge catalog down here, right? The, it, the huge artist catalog, and it's on their CV so they can get more funding for projects in the future, get more money, get more commissions, right? But what happens to people who got interested? Like the kid from that social housing unit who like had a show on the radio and then it was gone, right? Maybe they, then went to college and got involved in community radio or got involved in community radio some way. In New York City, there's a few spaces that this stuff can, you could kind of go to, right? People's Forum, Woodbine, some others. But there's not a lot, certainly where I am in rural New York, right? There's no place to go. There's zero places to go. So I think that duration question is really important and it's an important one to keep in mind. But I want to keep talking about it. I want more questions. I'm sorry. I get one question and I have a long answer. So I'm going to try to be shorter. Give me a yes, no question. I'm going to ask Olivia to uh, ask a question. I can't guarantee it's going to be a yes, no question. I was just thinking that it's not a yes or no question. Thank you so much for being with us today, Mark, and um, for talking about duration. I think. Um, as someone who does like community-based research is something I think a lot about is about that accountability over time. Um, and so slightly disconnected, my question is about um, how you find time for creative practice as someone, I'm coming from an academic writing framework and I'm wondering if you have any tips or tricks um, that you find useful as you make time for creative practice and make space for that writing um, that you would be willing to share. That's really broad, but I'll let you take it <laughs> as you wish. Yeah, well, you know, I, I used to uh, work in that kind of Ruchheiser tradition of documentary poetry, right? So the, the books that were mentioned earlier, like Shut Up, Shut Down, Call Them Out in Elementary, are part of that. And I just want to, while I'm here, shout out M.L. Liebler, uh, who I, whose glorious beard I see, who edited a really great anthology of working class poetry from Coffee House Press. Uh, ML, maybe you could put the title of it in the chat because uh, it was really a great, great anthology. And so if people are interested in those issues uh, and I haven't seen you for so long. So, um, but yeah, I, I was working in that vein and it became really kind of unsatisfying to me, you know, like, why am I going and do why, why does it have to go through me? Right. And how can I stop it from going through me? Right. And how can I become a facilitator of this work rather than documenting someone else's story or work? Why can I become sort of a conduit through which it happens, right? So I think it becomes trying to be, trying to borrow from social practice art that the project becomes the creative work. So I don't feel anymore like I have to sit down and write a poem, right? That for me, that energy, that creative energy is now in one cool thing we're doing with the haiku, two cool things that we're doing with the haiku, which again, take that space that I have for doing creative work. One is that on the night that the book is launched in Hudson, New York, uh, which is the probably city closest to where I live, right on the Hudson River between Albany and New York, uh, an organization there is do, has just started doing um, at night projections onto the sides of buildings. And so we've arranged to get the workers haiku, one from each worker as a, a kind of running stream on the wall outside projected at about two stories high. So as you come down that street, you'll be able to kind of read the poems and particularly if you're at the stoplight or on foot or on your bicycle or and it's a largely thoroughfare street in which, uh, you know, like you come out of work at the CVS and you'll be able to see these poems. You come out of the McDonald's and you'll be able to see these poems. Like, how do we find spaces 
to not return the work solely to people who will read the book or people who will see it on our Instagram page, right? We're um, posting haiku every other day on the Worker Writing School on Instagram, right? But if you're just walking out of the CBS, right? After you've worked stocking it, how can you see that poem? The other one is that we're working to do 10 second films of uh, a few of the haiku. And they're gonna be on, um, in New York City, the bus kiosks have video monitors on two sides, like it's a big glass video monitor. And so the haiku are gonna be 10 second films on the bus kiosks around New York. Uh, and that's going to run uh, during the summer. And so again, the bus kiosk being a space in which, you know, like Domestic Workers United, their members are on the buses getting to work all the time. So that people outside of the people who would find the book or the people who would see it on social media, that we can continue to use uh, new kind of modes of publishing. I'm really interested in this idea lately of light as a publishing mechanism. So one of the things I wanna to try to do is make some of the haiku into neon signs and put them in like laundromats or pizza places and hang them in windows, right? I'm interested in those gobo projectors, you know, like during Occupy Wall Street where they project the bat signal or like clubs use them to project their logo onto the side of a building. Like I wanna do haiku that way. Like I wanna project them on the side of a, you know, the big AFL-CIO building in Albany or something like that. Like find other ways to get the work out there to other kinds of groups and communities. So all the energy then is flowing into that rather than into um, me editing lines of my own poems. Now where I find time for that, I just, I get up really early in the morning. That's the only answer I have for that. I don't, I don't have much more. There's not, there's not a whole lot of answer. There's summer, I don't teach in the summers. And I'm, there's this thing called sabbatical that every once in a while floats across uh, my desk. So like every seven years or something like that. So those are really, I don't, I don't have good answers for that. It's really just, but this shift in where I weight my own creative practice versus this more social practice has been a big change for me over the course of the last five to 10 years. Thank you. I'm gonna ask uh, Dana uh, to ask a question. Hey Mark, thanks for being here tonight. Um, I have a question about uh, how you've navigated the institutional side of setting up workshops um, at places like prisons or factories um, that may be hostile initially to having a writing workshop. Um, and I'm curious what you've learned through that navigation. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really hard. It continues to be hard. Uh, you'll sometimes do a lot of work and you'll get like one or two people or nobody uh, who comes out. One of the stories I tell in um, in social poetics is that when I, I started doing the workshops at the Ford factory in St. Paul in 2005, maybe something like that, uh, Ford announced it was closing. They had this thing called the Ford had the way forward, it was called. And what the way forward was, was they're gonna become profitable by closing 13 plants across the US and Canada, lay off 30 to 40,000 workers and return to profitability, right? Like capitalism in a nutshell, basically. And so um, I had been doing other work with the um, UAW uh, that represented the forward workers. And I told them that I had just done one of these workshops, the first one with uh, a group in Chicago with the uh, International Brotherhood of uh, Teamsters and the, uh, no, no, the Teamsters and the IBEW, the Electrical Workers Union. Uh, and had a really good experience doing a workshop with that uh, and said, you know, the plant is closing. I remember what this was like when I was growing up in Buffalo and Bethlehem Steel was closing, the autumn plants were closing and how terrible it was. And what if I did this writing workshop in between shifts for workers at the plant? And, and they said yes, which was kind of this miraculous moment in my life. 
Uh, and so we met together in the, in the Ford plant and we wrote, uh, like some people took a, a break at the beginning of their shift and some people took a break at the end of their shift and we had some overlap of time for people to write. Uh, and then I got an idea, you know, you always get this great idea as an artist, like this is going to be your thing, this is going to be my big thing, uh, right, this is going to be it, I got it, this is it. So I was like, I'm going to do workshops at all the Ford plants that are closing as part of the, the way forward, right? I'm going to go to Canada. Almost all of them were like from Michigan to Virginia to Ohio. You know, it was kind of the Northeast, Midwest and lower Canada, lower Eastern Canada. And uh, I'm going to go to all of them. I'm going to do these workshops. I'm going to like get, I don't know, PBS interested and workers from all the plants closing and read their poems can be my great thing. I wrote emails and phone calls and letters to all of those unions, other 12 plants that were closing, the UAWs. I never heard a peep. I never got one response from anybody, right? And so that was really, uh, you know, I was like, oh, this could be the end of it all. And then I got this grant uh, to go, a research grant uh, to go to South Africa to do some research at the National English Language Museum. Because I wanted to, like, you couldn't find this guy's books anywhere. Alfred Temba Kabula. He was like, you couldn't find them. Like these are published by the union. They're like on, you know, like, like a paperback published by a South African trade union. And this was before like aid books and all this. Like you, you just couldn't find these things. So I, I wanted to go to South Africa to study these books. And I got this grant to go. And here's the good way. you. All of you, if you want to do projects like this, you just put on your Robin Hood hat, right? And so if someone gives you money, you use it for what you want to do, right? You say you're going to do this thing. Well, I did it. I went to the museum. I spent two days there, et cetera. But I was, you know, this was the early days of the internet. These were like the old, I don't know, AOL Netscape days, right? And so I found somewhere on the web, someone at NUMSA, which is the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, was like the publicist for the union. I found his email address and I wrote him this letter. And I just said, I've been teaching these workshops at this Ford plant in, in Minnesota that's closing and working with the workers. And I'm coming to South Africa and I know there are a couple, uh, there are auto plants there. And I only knew that really from the playwright Athel Fugard, right? And his journals uh, and his famous play uh, about, about the South African Ford plant. And uh, I said, you know, I'm coming to South Africa and I'm gonna be here. And if there's any way I could like, you know, have a workshop and I knew that wasn't gonna happen, right? Or like just meet with you and talk with some workers or present on the Ford workers, uh, you know, workshop in the US. I, I would love the opportunity to do that. And thanks so much for listening, right? And like two days later, I got a two page email back saying, dear comrade Mark, we would like to host you at the uh, Ford engine plant in Port Elizabeth on the southern tip and in the manufacturing plant in Pretoria, the capital. And we would like you to do a two day workshop and poetry workshop in each location, eight hours each day poetry workshop with the group. Uh, are you a vegetarian for your uh, catered lunch? Here is the mobile number of the driver who will pick you up at your guest house, uh, Comrade Lee, and then his name, right? And it was like, I had gone from 12 rejection, not to review my rejection, I didn't get a rejection, nothing, silence, to this email sent to South Africa in which I had an itinerary driver's catered lunches, 16 hour, two day workshop in two different Ford plants. And, you know, I, I then of course, over time and reading and doing them and everything else came to realize that it was of course, because cultural work and radical political work and labor in South Africa had always gone together, right? It wasn't like here in the United States where here is cultural work and here are trade unions and here is the Biden administration or something like that. Like this, the, the ANC, NUMSA, the Communist Party were all incredibly closely linked in South Africa and cultural work had always been an essential part of the anti-apartheid struggle. Trade union movement had always been an essential part 
of the anti-apartheid struggle. And so when they saw a poet working at a Ford plant in the United States, they're like, we know this, right? We've done this, we've seen this, we haven't had a US person come and do it, so let's make that happen, right? So it was a completely different relationship. And I'd say that now I work very little with the trade unions, like AFL-CIO, SEIU, all the bigger trade unions, they don't answer phone calls. But there is a movement, a lot in New York, but all around the country of worker centers, of worker center movement. And the worker centers are like this topic of a people's history, bottom up movements, right? Domestic Workers United, it's um, Latin American and Caribbean women organizing for their rights, workplace rights, right? Not dues paying under a big union umbrella, but people getting together and organizing. Right. And they have been, these groups have been incredible. All the groups I mentioned earlier, Street Vendor Project, et cetera, et cetera. All of these have, have been parts of that. And particularly when I propose it outside of the United States, right? So I've done workshops like these with groups in, in, in London, in Brussels, in Amsterdam, in The Hague, in Panama workshops. And whenever I write, I always get a response. I never do not get a response when I email organizers outside of the United States. You know, in the United States, no. You got you got to do, you know, 50 laps for one worker, right? And in elsewhere around the world, you do one lap for 50 workers. So so it's a challenge that, you know, I keep taking on here because I think it's so important here in in this place where we we are. So thanks for the question. Thank you. I'm gonna invite Hannah to ask the next question. Hi, uh, I wanna reiterate the thanks for being here and sharing with us. This is really, really incredible. Um, I was curious, so you've mentioned facilitating workshops in so many different places with so many different groups of workers and people with just radically different life experiences. And I was wondering how your uh, strategies for facilitating these workshops have changed or how you've changed them based on who you were working with and also what you've sort of learned and how you've adapted through that process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one is, of course, that piece I was talking about earlier, the durational piece, right? Uh, I think that's incredibly important. And that has, was not as clear to me early on, like we would start with Domestic Workers United, we would do a four month workshop and then do an event and then do one with another group. And then it just, at a certain point after doing that a couple of times, it was silly to me, like, why are we not bringing the taxi drivers? We had an event when I moved up, up here where we brought the migrant farm workers down to do a reading at the Union Square Farmers Market. So they were in, in New York City. And so they were reading in front of and around the stands of the farms at which they worked, right? And so we kind of wanted to put a spin on that, no farms, no food. You're doing such a great thing by shopping at the farmer's market, but we never talk about the workers, right? Who are doing, who are picking those apples, picking that lettuce, doing that work in the rain and the hazy heat and everything else. We don't, we don't mention that, but it's a farmer's market. So it's, right? Uh, so we wanted to put a spin on that. So we did that, but then we also did another event where we brought the domestic workers and the taxi drivers and the farm workers all together to do a reading. And it was just so great. It was obvious that we needed to switch the plan and do that. So I think that that duration question and that bringing the groups together uh, was a really important one. The other one, and this is really a, a key to the kind of worker writer school model, is that we always, we won't just set up a, like a workshop at the public library and say, workers come to the workshop, the work for working people, blah, 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 blah. We always have been and always will be in collaboration with trade unions, worker centers. We're starting a new program with this organization called COSH, of which I think there's one in Washington too, the Council on Occupational Safety and Health, a new series of workshops. And so it's important for us to always be really grounded and in collaboration with labor organizations because, and I think this is a really important point, in the typical creative writing workshop, right? Like say you're doing a workshop with uh, the domestic workers, right? At the library in Brooklyn, right? 
And one of the domestic workers wrote a poem about like what I said earlier, they're making, they're a live-in domestic worker 24 hours a day, but they're only being paid minimum wage for eight hours a day, right? And their rights are being cut off or they're being sexually abused by the husband of the family that they work for, right? And they write a poem, they write a story about that. In the typical creative writing workshop model, right? The one practiced in most places, the only thing you can offer that worker is empathy, right? You can feel bad for their situation. You can express heartbreak and remorse. And that seems to me a very liberal, neoliberal response, right? That seems to me like not nearly enough, right? For us who are very far to the left of the liberal, neoliberal position, it is, well, we wanna always be able to say, that is a terrible situation. And here is an organizer and an organization that can teach you about your workplace rights, put you in co contact with a pro bono attorney, put you in a community of other women or other workers, right? Who are experience, have experiences and things like this and know how to navigate it in the world. We can't separate the poem or the story as an aesthetic cultural practice away from the legality, the organizing, the, the you know, the, the, philosophers have only interpreted the world, the point is to change it, going back to my quote from early on, right? Like we want to always be there to be able to say, not only is this terrible and bad and fix this line break, or that's a bad metaphor, right, of the typical workshop, but here are your workplace rights, here are organizers, here is a lawyer, here is whatever the case may be, right? That, that has to be the initial one, two step of what happens in that moment, right? It can't be that's terrible. Okay, now to Mary's poem, right? That, can, with, that can't happen, right? That's a terrible, that's a, I mean, and we've been doing that for like the, the, the entire poetry workshop. I mean, the poetry workshop has that, I, I like this, it has that on its shoulders, right? That it's, carried, that it's operated that way for since its inception, right? And so one of the big things for us is trying to change that, right? And so that's why I go around and, and love doing these conversations and, and having them because it's that, that framework of it needs to change, right? It, it can't just be about, you know, well, if we are free, we are free to choose a tradition, right? That Muriel Rukeyser quote that I started with. And so, I'm choosing a different tradition than the one that can only bring empathy as a response. And so that's been a, a huge thing that I've learned. And I want to add that it has been learned, taught to me by, by members of Domestic Workers United, who we've been working, I've been working with for 10 years, and those members who have been coming. It has been through working nonstop with them and seeing their ongoing struggles as workers in that field that has that has taught that to me. That's not something I discovered on my own. Thank you. I'm gonna invite Charu to ask the next question, our resident Marxist. You're muted too. Thanks, Chingi. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, I am the resident Marxist. I, I do want to note as well, I'm not remotely a poet or a literary critic. I, I'm an economist, I'm an actual, uh, PhD, academic, I teach economics, economist. Uh, I uh, was the editor. I mean, Chingi is my colleague. We are in the same school. We are in the same school. Uh, we are part of this project. I was the past editor for many years of the journal Rethinking Marxism. I'm currently on the advisory board. I'm part of this. So yeah, I'm the resident Marxist. <laughs> so my question is actually not asked to you as a poet mm -hmm. who is trying to figure out how to be radical, 
My question to you is from the other side. I'm a Marxist. I have spent a lot of time in radical movements. And I want to ask you about your sense of the relationship between genre of form and content. That is as, you know, when I come to these conversations, I am often the base to your superstructure. <laughs> I am often supposed to supply to you all the data or the stories or the case studies. Uh, and then you will tell a story. But over time, I have come to be clear given my own politics. And I'm going to give you some examples which are from my, one of my, not the only, but one of my main political contexts, which is India. So I am thinking, for example, of one of the biggest roles, uh, one of my mentors when I was a graduate student uh, at UMass Amherst had on me, he was a poet. His name was Abha Shahid Ali. Uh, and he did ghazal. And he spent a lot of time thinking about the poetic form the politics of the poetic form and inviting Western poets writing in English to think about Ghazal and the poetic form uh, due to its history, its politics and so on. And I'm raising this because your comment about it's not tradition if I don't get to change it or own it spoke to me equivalent to, uh, you know, if I can't dance, it's not my revolution, right? It's It was really to me that powerful uh, but at the same time, to make it work, you have to navigate the difference between owning something and respecting the genre and its role in relationship to voice versus, uh, I don't know, Gwyneth Paltrow, <laughs> yoga in the West, whatever, right? And even worse, the sort of uh, left, vocabulary around cultural politics in the US that can't distinguish between an English language Shah, Aga Shahid Ali, who is working with Adrian Rich and the others to make a radical statement on what does Ghazal mean versus uh, cultural appropriation. So that all projects get shut down. And the one I'm thinking about right now is that we have been in tremendous struggle in India around NRCCAA, it has hit Seattle area because there are uh, lots of Indians in this area because of Microsoft. And there are many of them who support the Modi government and they support a sort of majoritarian view of my nation's culture. Uh, and it's accepted by many of so-called left-wing colleagues of mine and community members of mine who don't feel they need to know about the politics of where I am, just to support Hindus or Indians or whatever, versus the politics that have resulted in say, um, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, there's been a bunch of poems. One was, hum kagaz nahi dikhayenge. we will not show our papers. This is the government is asking us to show papers. Uh, and the other is actually Roger Waters from Pink Floyd did a translation of uh, a poet from India saying, Sab yaad rakha jayega. We will remember everything you did to us. It doesn't matter what happens tomorrow, I will remember, I will document. We will remember, Sab yaad rakha jayega. Every insult, every slight, every prison, every, right? And I, I want to ask you about this in relation to a movement called Poetry of Witness that some of my students have talked to me about. I'm not a poet. I don't know about this movement, but I've been trying really hard as an economist to think about not my accountability, but how I interact with people in the field, given I'm not a poet, but I am actually an activist from the field uh, in India, uh, working with various forms. And you are someone who's taken haiku, who's taken voices of people from your side of this exchange, what would you tell your poetic comrades here in this room about how do you thread that needle between a uh, neoliberal cultural appropriation uh, versus knee jerk political correctness 
you can't do this to let's create this culture together for transformation because it feels to me those are the 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 first two are the only options most of my students come to me with and i'm not enough of a poet or a genre person that i can tell them what that third part is and it feels to me you're doing the third part and i would love to hear you hear your thoughts about genre voice uh, politics and not falling into either extreme yeah yeah it's a thank you for the question uh, it's a really interesting question that I know for sure I'm not going to have a yes or no answer on. So uh, I think there's a couple of things, right? One of the things that uh, genre requires is this notion of durational study, right? And again, it's sort of one of the, the reasons I focus on. So I'm, 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 the thinking I'm doing around duration is a lot around um, through composers. Uh, mm -hmm. through John Cage, uh, through others, but then also through, um, you, there's a really great book by Fred Moten and Stefano Harney mm -hmm. that you can, everybody can download for free uh, called The Undercommons and their notion of study, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of what it means to study. So our relationship to genre is a relationship to study, right? And it's, if you say haiku in most places in the world, I, I think including in like, top graduate MFA programs around the country, if you started saying, I'm gonna write haiku, people would think you're sort of crazy. Like that's something that was done, uh, you know, by part-time non-poets. It was done a long time ago. It's great exercise in third or fourth grade. But one of the things I've tried to trace and work together with the workers on is that it also has this incredibly radical tradition. So we can read the form as, you know, let's go in third grade and write three lines and count on our fingers, the syllables and everything else. But let's look at the, the practice of writing them in Japanese American internment camps and in Attica prison and, and what that means to study the form in that kind of deep ongoing context. And then one of the reasons I think that, that haiku worked as well is its compactness. Right, so I'm always, whenever we, we meet, I'm giving workers like little notebooks I come across that fit in a, in a pocket, right? And say, keep this in your bag, in your tote, in your pocket, whatever, when you're riding the subway, riding the bus, and, and just write down what you see, right? Uh, you know, it was sort of a, like the, the, the CLR James kind of tradition, right? Uh, of that kind of worker uh, um, notation, right? Of writing down. And in part, that was a very practical thing, but in part, it was like with me being inspired by Domestic Workers United, it was inspired by a factory worker at the Ford plant who was in the workshop, whose name was Denny Dickhausen. And Denny, when we first started the workshops and he came to the first workshop said, you know, I've worked here for 25, 30 years, and I always kept these little, you know, those pocket notebooks that have a spiral on the top and you can flip them over, right? So he said, I always carried those in my pocket during the shift. And if I noticed something or someone would say something, I would like jot it down if I, when I was on break or when I went to the bathroom, right? Or after work on my way out when I showered. And then I kept them and I'd fill them up over time. And then I'd stick it in a shoe box in my basement. And I never knew what to do with them. I just thought I, you know, it was like taking notes. And then when I saw the advertisement in the in the union newsletter for this workshop, I thought, oh, that's a place I could like take some of the stuff from my notebooks and work on it. And so I think it's always a, a way to try to find forms to work in that are, in our instance, really practical for the workers. You know, if if Maybe it's possible to do a novella class with workers, but I would find that extremely difficult to do. Uh, so we've worked on a lot of pocket forms that are pocket notebook forms that are have both, if you do the research, a kind of a radical tradition, a radical internationalist tradition, right? That I think, um, that I think is really important to bring, given especially the, the makeup of our group. But I would say part of the argument um, that the work tries to make is to the literary community as well. And so there's a, there's a part in social poetics when I talk about 
uh, the Sandinista victory and the move by Ernesto Cardinal, a very well-known poet, uh, who is Minister of Culture, to establish uh, writing workshops in peasant rural farming communities all across the country uh, and was very successful at it. Uh, he had something like 70 or 80 workshops in, in every, I don't know what the word is, like the equivalent of a county in the United States, right? Everyone had its own workshop. They had its own Mimeo printing press. They had its own radio station where workers could read. And the radio station, I think, is a totally untapped thing for working communities, especially here in the US. There's a great organization, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers in Florida, that has a great worker center with a radio station and does other things. Our workers are going to be on um, WBAI, a great radio station in New York City, because one of the taxi drivers has a show there. Uh, and so he's going to bring people on. But, but when Ernesto Cardinal did that, there was incredible pushback from the literary authors of the time in the country because they didn't want a kind of horizontalization of cultural production. They, didn't, they wanted a audience for their work, right? So they wanted their great works of literature that they were producing to get more distribution into the peasant farming rural communities, right? They didn't want the, the workers to become authors themselves, right? And this is a real kind of tension that I think still exists today, right? Like, and that the former notion being a, a very kind of capitalist model and the other one being a much more socialist Marxist model of, of who, who becomes the producer of this work. And so I think to me, that's really embedded in that question of form is like, not only that, like, are we going to write haikus or are we going to write sonnets or are we going to write free verse or are we going to participate in the 100th anniversary of Walt Whitman's birth on Coney Island or go to the Union Docks Festival, but how are we going to change that relationship to writer, author, worker, publishing platforms, etc. It's a uh, I don't have a great answer to the question yet, but it's one that really drives me to keep working. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm wondering if you could talk more about um, the publishing platform and in your thoughts about, um, you know, what would, what might be, um, new ways to think about publishing um, and getting, um, you know, getting work out there other than what you've mentioned, you know, radio stations and um, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have a great answer to that. I'm really interested in this point I talked about earlier about light right? And about, about working class spaces, right? And, and organizing, the publication of people's work in, like I imagine strips in cities and towns that have a couple stores next to each other. And each one, as you drive by at night, has one of the worker poems in a neon light. And what it would be like, like that would be a small street level chap book that was on 24 hours a day. And what that would mean to, you know, like you could read that poem if you were the trash collector in that town who drives by at five o'clock in the morning. And you could read that worker poem if you were, you know, the, the Domino's pizza delivery driver who goes back up and down that strip over and over. That would be some, I mean, these would be workers that almost we would have no access to, particularly here in the States, right? They're not part of any kind of revolutionary organization, political organization. A lot of them, if they're members of trade unions, treat their trade union kind of like you treat your Geico insurance. Like if you get hurt, you you know call them up uh, on the job and see, or you get fired, you see what your workplace rights are, but otherwise not any kind of real organizing work uh, unless it's November of an election year. And then the unions really, I guess, try to get people out. Um, but, but the, I, I'm, and the bus kiosks in these spaces, like, that's what I want. I mean, one of the good things that the poetry world has done is they, they've had a kind of a, 
a um, tradition of doing things like poets on uh, poems and buses, poems on subways, uh, which I think are great. But the producers of that work are always people who have like won the National Book Award and have been the poet laureate of the country, right? Like I always seem, whenever I'm on the subway in New York, I'm always standing next to a Billy Collins poem, it seems, you know, and, and, and so uh, I want that leveling of the cultural production to go hand in hand with a much wider frame of distribution for the work. And so, you know, I'm constantly thinking for those ideas. If people have ideas, send them to me. They're like, well, we'll try to do it. Uh, um, I'm, I'm very much a receptacle for any ideas to, to push that kind of stuff forward or do it yourselves in your own communities. I mean, the work of writer school is not a, you know, the only thing we ask is that you collaborate with a worker center or organization and you keep doing it. You don't do it short term, then do the model in your community as well. Keep it going. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I think we've come to the end of our questions. So um, if anyone has a final question, um, you can send it our way. Um, this has been an amazing evening. Um, thank you so much for uh, sharing your, your experience with us and, and um, also your suggestions and your thoughts. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, and um, while we see if there's any, a, a last question to round out the evening, um, I just wanted to put your attention that we do have some upcoming talks as well. Um, and it's always, it's, it's basically every Thursday at this time, six to eight for the next few weeks. Um, next week, we have Brenda Cardenas, um, who's gonna be talking about writing working class lives. Um, and then the following week, there's gonna be a round table um, with the Feminist Radical Political Economy Collective organized by um, my colleague Taru. Um, and then um, the following week, there'll be a talk by Kale Fajardo on um, um, mutual aid and LGBTQ um, issues. And, um, and then the last thing I wanted to um, mention, and if Simon, if you wouldn't mind, um, dropping that into the chat um, is, is we are actually the, the class um, in, the, in our final weeks, um, uh, we're gonna be doing a speculative storytelling session, um, thinking about how to reimagine some of these areas of work, labor and um, solidarity economies. Um, and, the, and we're gonna be opening up um, 14 slots for community members. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in, um, um, Simon has dropped the link in the chat. I think Simon, you also dropped the Google link so people can register. Um, the dates are there um, and it's gonna be six to nine on three Thursdays. Um, and we're opening up 14 slots basically double, doubling the number of folks in the class. Um, and we are gonna be prioritizing just like a wide range of participants um, and also folks who are connected to the communities that we're working with. But if you're interested, please, please um, fill out the, the, um, the registration because we would love to, um, we'd love to speculate with you. Um, and, and there are more details also in that doc. So, um, I'm just looking to see if we have any final questions and it looks like we don't. So um, other than will there be a recording available? And yes, yes, um, a recording will be sent out um, to everyone who registered. So thank you so gonna, much. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I just wanna jump in with one final thing. I'm gonna put again uh, in the chat, the link to our link tree, which has all the information. And if you think of a question tomorrow, or we're launching Zoom workshops that are available to everyone, if you know a essential worker who might be interested, please get in touch with us. Uh, you can send us a message through Instagram, Twitter, worker writers, uh, the Gmail, any of those, and they're all in the LinkedIn. So Thank you everybody for the great questions, for the opportunity to have this conversation. I, uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for organizing and putting it together. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for also the, the link tree. And I see that there's also links to get the coronavirus haiku anthology. Um, thank you so much. Um, and everyone have a great rest of your night.
Um, and if you are in the labor stories class, uh, we're going to take half an hour and meet in our regular Zoom room at 8 p.m. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.